those that work forces are the same that burn crosses. Some of those that work forces are the same that burn crosses. Some of those that work forces are the same that burn crosses. Some of those that work forces are the same that burn crosses. Welcome to another special edition of WLRN's podcast series. WLRN was founded in May 2016 after women realized the blatant sexist censorship of women's free expression and ideas at the local community radio station in Madison, Wisconsin, where our fearless leader Thistle resides. We have been crafting a monthly podcast ever since and occasionally branch out to do special editions like this one when the occasion arises. And what an occasion it is! We are broadcasting today in celebration of the launch of the Women's Human Rights Campaign in the USA. I'm Sekhmet Shiaul, WLRN member since July 2016, desert dweller, female separatist, and proud angry feminist. The focus of this special edition is on the organization and thought behind the Women's Human Rights Campaign, or WHRC, and what organizers hope the campaign will do to help the plight of women worldwide. In today's program, we'll hear excerpts of interviews Thistle did with Vajra Ma, spiritual leader and woman-centered activist participating in the launch and development of WHRC USA, and with Carol, 40-year-old detransitioning woman from California. WLRN shout out to Bree Jontry of Fourth Wave Now for referring us to Carol and to Carol for granting us an interview. We wanted to hear both from WHRC USA leadership and from a detransitioning woman for this episode because detransitioning women are one of the demographics hardest hit by gender identity culture and politics, something the WHRC specifically organizes itself around. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you on the other side of the interviews with my commentary on this momentous occasion of women getting organized around our sex-based rights on this stolen parcel of land called the United States. You are listening to WLRN. Brought to you by the totally excellent radical feminists at Women's Women's Liberation Liberation Radio 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 News. News. We now turn to our interviews for this program, examining the Women's Human Rights Campaign's creation of a written document called the Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights and what it means for getting organized and taking action in the U.S. and globally as a network of females fighting for females. Vajra Ma co-chairs the Interim Steering Committee of WHRC USA. She is co-founder and president of Shakti Moon Foundation, dedicated to woman as the creator of culture and original guide of humanity. She has taught feminist spirituality and body knowing since the late 1980s, and her essays are published in six anthologies. Vajra Ma is the creator of the award-winning website, womens-spirituality.org. 30 interviews with the founding mothers of the spiritual component of second wave feminism. Here now is an excerpt of an interview Thistle did with Vajra back on July 13th in preparation for WHRC USA's launch. Okay, welcome to WLRN, Vajra Ma. Thank you. Good to be here. So we're talking today about the formation of the WHRC USA, the Women's Human Rights Campaign here in the good old USA, and your role in it, and how it's related to the larger international group. Can you just introduce yourself, say a little bit about yourself, and how you found out about the WHRC USA and how organizing is going? Yes, um, I'd love to. I, um, as for myself, um, I'm an older woman and very glad to be doing this work and that this is happening around the the world, this move for global solidarity. Uh, I am a um, feminist spirituality teacher and my feminism came, I came in through uh, spirituality, women's spirituality. Uh, I learned about the Women Human Rights Campaign, you know, I actually don't remember, somehow online, and I saw it, and so I signed, and then I started, I, uh, through Facebook, I connected with people who were involved, um, and so that's how it happened, and that's how it always happens. It always happens through some kind of a network, doesn't it? 
Um, right now, Thistle, I am on the um, I'm the co-chair of the steering committee uh, that we have um, for the USA branch, which has just been going on for maybe like about three months, maybe um, started, mm-hmm. and um, there are about I would say twelve of us who are actively involved, including you, and. Uh, mm-hmm. Um, I want to just give a picture to everyone out there what the Women's Human Rights Campaign is. And very briefly, their summary is this. And you can find this at womensdeclaration.com. And the declaration reaffirms women and girls' sex-based rights and challenges the discrimination we experience from the replacement of the category of sex with that of, quote-unquote, gender identity. And so the campaign is to educate and then advocate in legislatures, uh, in the law, in schools, in the public awareness, to advocate for the damage that, uh, advocate for the preservation of women's sex-based rights, which are being damaged by gender identity, replacing the definition of sex in the law. So Mm -hmm. that's basically what it is. You can sign the declaration. You can sign it as an organization or as an individual. And right now, just so people know, I have the statistics on that. How many have signed? I know that they've hit over 10,000 now, 10,000 signatures. Yeah. Yeah, and in 171 countries, I believe it is. Well. Okay. Yeah. And and there the international group is holding weekly webinars. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about those webinars? Oh yes. Yeah. Okay, here it is. 10,505 individual signatures from 117 countries. Yeah. Yeah, these teleconferences awesome. that the UK, uh, you know, Women Human Rights Campaign is based out of the UK and it was founded by Sheila Jeffries and Maureen O'Hara and um, Heather Brunskell Evans. And they're the authors of the declaration. And so for a few months now, like maybe three months, I don't don't know how many months, I've attended all of them. They're having weekly teleconferences on Saturdays, Saturday mornings at 7 a.m. Pacific time. And this, of course, is a different time in the UK. And these panels that they're giving, these are live panels that are recorded and then also put up on their YouTube page so people can look at them afterwards and they're very well edited so it moves along quickly but they're and like, you know what's what's really exciting about those panel yeah. discussions is the presence of an audience you can feel the energy from all yeah. over the world because it's like hundreds of women that you are are united are coming to have a dialogue have a discussion and get reports from other women in other parts of the world and That's what I find so exciting about it is the live aspect of it. I do too. That's why I show up every, every Saturday to watch it and Mm -hmm. to feel into it, like you're saying, and to feel the connection globally, women from all kinds of different countries. And it's in English, you know, bless their hearts. These women from that who are multilingual, who are speaking in English, you know, for the sake of this teleconference. Uh, And they usually have about four women on a panel and they're talking about what's going on in their country and women can send in, questions in advance to be answered. So that's fantastic. Um, uh, So it's very much interactive. And I was on one of the panels and so were you. So uh, yeah, that was, that was, it's pretty cool that way. It's so it's like, because it's, it's giving a platform to feminists and feminist active activists and organizers. And then those women start talking to each other, which is what I feel like is happening with the WHRC internationally, but also specifically in the United States. So the the declaration was first presented in New York City, and WLRN was there to cover it with a cell phone, you know, because no major media was there, and it was like at a secret location. Uh Um, And that was in 2019. It was, you know, last year, not this year. Mm -hmm. And so it took a little while for us to gain enough momentum for the USA group to be conceived of. And can you talk about how it's been in the last uh, approximately, I think you're right, three months Mm -hmm. and now leading up to the launch, which this interview is going to be a part of our launch. What have been the goals? How did those organizers, those 12 women or so come together and how did they know each other? 
how have things been going with group dynamics and getting our wheels in motion? Wow. Oh, that's a, but, but just so everybody knows, we're in July 2020 right now. So they get a, a sense, you know, of where we are, the date. I came in through the woman that started the organizing. Her name is Sabina. And she, I'm trying to think this, so I don't really remember quite how the others came in and how we found each other. I just know that Sabina had um, organized a Zoom conference. And so women, um, somehow she got the word out and the women that showed up are the women that showed up. Interesting. It'd be interesting to trace how that happened. Well, she was, my experience of that is I was invited by Sabina, who was the country contact for the USA WHRC group, to be in a group with Kara Dansky and Natasha Chart, and we started talking as a group. Mm -hmm. And I, then I noticed that Sabina was making all these different groups and bringing us all together and there were so many groups, but yet, and so it all kind of like sifted into this, what we have now. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and it's amazing because just as an organizer, thinking of the things that we've already achieved without even having like our structure in place over the last three months, it's been mm-hmm. kind of awesome. What, what I like about that, Thistle, you're touching on is that we've been working organically. We've been working by what's my desire? What do I want to bring to this? What excites well enough so that that organic process can happen without having to have some bureaucratic structure? We're setting up some structure that's necessary. So we're talking about, I was talking about how we've been unfolding, we're a small enough group, like 12 or 15 of us, to be able to just unfold organically saying, oh, I like this, this excites me, I want to do this, I want to do that, and following that natural desire uh, of what excites you and is, is, what, is how we've been developing so far without a lot of bureaucratic structure. And I think what we're also focusing on, Thistle, as you know, is to keep the bureau- bureaucratic structure as simple and bare bone as possible so that we have this room to move organically. So we don't get caught up in the bureaucracy and the rules and that sort of thing. You know, rules really come out of courtesy and uh, making things move along without getting stuck. So to whatever extent we need those rules, we're we're applying them. But we're making sure that we don't get um, into some kind of bureaucratic um, red tape with each other. And I think we're doing Mm -hmm. a good job. I think we're doing a good job. And like you said, there's a lot of things we already have rolling for the launch, you know, to make our debut and get the word out um, about what we're doing here uh, with the campaign. Yeah. And there are also things that we've already achieved, which is amazing considering that we don't, we don't know each other that well, this group that's been sifted and now has come together and you know there's going to be some more women that are coming on board now that we have our volunteer yeah. application that's yeah. process <laughs> yeah so yeah. it'll be fascinating but you know the the WHRC USA solidarity group that was born out of that desire and that passion and that flame and the knowledge that you we can be autonomous you know, we don't need to always, we can speak for ourselves as a subgroup. Yeah. And we just so, so quickly, because there was some protest about that. Like, because at first the group, one of the groups that Sabina created had like 32 women in it. Remember that? And she sent out this email about the Green Party and mm-hmm. it kind of, it, it turned into some problems. And we were able to overcome that by allowing those women who were interested to form their own group and put their own names on it and do their own thing. And then lo and behold, we had a success within the Green Party, yes. you know, um, with the, the letter to the delegates that we sent. Well, tell them about that was time sensitive. Tell we, everybody, we couldn't wait. Well, tell everybody about it. Tell them, nobody knows what you're talking about yet. Tell them what happened with the Green Party and what that was about. It's very exciting. <laughs> I mean, there's so much ha- happening with the Green Party. And I don't understand all of it, like the structure of the National Committee and how those people are called delegates. And then there's also like the convention delegates. And so there's, there's all this stuff that I'm learning about. I just know that 
Proposition 1019, which was about entering, getting language in, in the national committee policies about the seats and the gender parity language that's already in there that intends for the seats to be at least 50% women. Mm-hmm. Well, the trans activists in the Green Party are saying, oh, we need to change this language because it's not inclusive of transgender and non-binary and asexual identities or all these other identities besides just men and women. And so, you know, there is this proposal to create seats, 50% of the seats would be for non-binary or something. I don't remember the exact details. But then what became the logical conclusion was that then those 10 seats could theoretically be held all by all men, you know, because men can identify as being non-binary. And so, we didn't want that proposal to pass. <laughs> and there was like a voting period and a deadline for us to get our letter to these delegates to try to influence the vote. And so it was really hard because we didn't have the whole WHRC USA behind us. We just had this little subgroup that we were working in. And then there were like some divisions and difficulties in our in our subgroup as well. I mean, it was fascinating from like a sociological perspective to just watch how women finally were able to come to an agreement and get that letter out. And then how much of a splash that letter made in in the well, na- on yes. the national level. Yeah, yeah the Green, Green Party, Party the Green Party tabled the vote and they backed down. Yeah. So this was really yeah. important. And this is a really good example of how a small group of women can have a profound effect. And so as we look at, at becoming globally uh, solid, our global solidarity with women's human rights campaign, we can, you know, multiply that exponentially. You know, small groups of women in all these different countries uh, taking actions like you did with a solidarity group. With, as, um, and what's also wonderful about the teleconferences every week is because we, we start to see, we see real faces with real women. And so when we have these teleconferences and when we are, we are connected into the women's human rights campaign, we feel that collective. We, we feel, feel that, that collective. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. You froze for a second. So that's why <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it took a second. All right, so we were talking about the power of small groups of women. I'm talking about like three or four or five and of them organizing in groups and taking direct action in their countries and then being able to report back to WHRC as an international organization live on these webinars and what that does to our movement. Yeah. Yeah, it's very exciting. So the seeing at women's faces, hearing them speak in person, especially live, about what they're doing, really en- encourages us all to step step out and step forward. Because as we know, in this movement of, of trying to stop the damage of gender identity, women are viciously attacked. And anybody who speaks out about biological reality and women's rights especially gets just excoriated. They can lose their jobs. They can be, you know, trolled and doxxed. They can, they feel very much in danger. And so the more of us that uh, speak out and see each other's faces around the world and take action, we are encouraging each other. And so that's, that's why this global organization, the Women's Human Rights Campaign, protecting sex-based rights is so important. Mm -hmm. So here we are. What do you think is going to happen in the next weeks and months. Like you said earlier, this is July 13th that we're speaking. Yeah. Um, 2020 and our launch is somewhere around August 15th or 17th. Um, that's when our listeners are going to be listening to this program. Can you just give us a little bit of a timeline and a trajectory and what you see in the future for WHRC as an organization and its influence on the women's movement? I can't say, you know, who could say what would happen in the next month, but I do know that things, things grow logarithmically. It's like a snowball, right? A few people speak out and then more, like we've seen with JK Rowling, who's um, speaking out very courageously and holding her space and holding her ground against the terrible tirades against her and the slurs and the, the the hatred, really, the hatred. They accuse, other, they accuse people who speak out for biological reality as being hate, 
hateful, but it's really the other way around uh, to excoriate somebody for just speaking their opinion. And people who, we need to really have respect for diverse opinions. And that's being destroyed around the world. So it's very important. I think one of the most important things that, that the women's, I'm kind of getting off on a different angle than what you asked, but that for us to speak together as women uh, around the world um, uh, helps to combat this horrible censorship that's going on of free speech. So I think that we're going to grow logarithmically. And, and I use J.K. Rowling as an example of someone who is like leading the way in being able to face the onslaught of vicious slander and attempt to destroy people's work and their right to free speech. You know, this is very much a part of women's sex-based rights because it's that onslaught, that censorship that's been going on by trans activists not just trans-identified people, many of whom are not involved in this viciousness, but the trans activists are extremely vicious and damaging. So the more we come together and feel our global solidarity, the more we're going to be able to protect everybody's rights to free speech and to mm -hmm. being able to, uh, and for women to have maintain our sex-based rights as women. We mm -hmm. have fought for centuries. For this. Well, thank you so much, Vajra. Be courageous, women, and join the WHRC today. And it. um, it's, mm -hmm. so, <laughs> it's so wonderful to talk with you and to work with you. And I hope we have many weeks and months and years ahead of us working together in the women's movement and working on women's rights and also the rights for all citizens to participate in society free of fearing reprisal. Yes. So, thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful to be here. That was Are You a Lady by Bratmobile, a song suggested by our next guest on the program. In this excerpt, you'll hear Thistle speaking with Carol, a 40-year-old detransitioned lesbian who lives in California with her wife and son. Carol spent four years identifying as a trans man and undergoing medical transition, including ingesting hormones and having her breasts surgically removed. 
during that time, she was perceived as a male in social and professional settings. Now, in the process of reclaiming her womanhood, Carol is focusing her energy on helping other D-trans people find a community, particularly women who don't conform to gender stereotypes. All right. So welcome to WLRN, Carol. Thank you so much for granting us an interview. Oh, thank you for having me. Why don't we get started with you just telling our listeners a little bit about yourself when you transitioned, how old you were, and what was your life like at that time? Like what was going on in your life that pushed you towards transitioning? Okay. Um, I was 34, almost 35 when I started um, the transition process, when I started taking testosterone. Four months into taking testosterone, I had a double mastectomy. I was first exposed to the transgender kind of ideology or the idea of being trans when I was only about 21. In the lesbian community, it uh, kind of seemed like overnight all of the all of my friends who were just butch women suddenly started identifying as trans men. Um, most of them didn't transition because at that time uh, there was some pretty heavy gatekeeping still involved in the therapeutic community. So transition wasn't easy, but they all identified that way. And that's the seed kind of got planted then. And I, I from that point on kind of self-identified as really a man, even though I didn't say it to anybody other than my wife and no one really I didn't demand, you know, pronoun usage or anything like that. But in my head, that's what soothed me was to think of myself as a man, not a lesbian. And then fast forward to 32, 33, me and my wife had just adopted uh, our son. I became a parent for the first time. It was very stressful. Me and my wife's relationship wasn't going well. Her brother and my very close friend committed suicide. And it really kind of drove the family into a crisis mode. And my wife was very much in crisis. And I felt like I was drowning. I felt suicidal. I wanted out of my life and I didn't know how to get out of my life. And I latched back on to this idea of transition and that if I transitioned, I would feel better. I wouldn't have to deal with the dysphoria on top of everything else. I have to say it wasn't a conscious thought of I want to escape my life, so I'm going to transition. It was more like I just felt very, very overwhelmed by everything and thought that the reason I was having so much depression and so much angst and just hating myself was because I needed to transition. Okay. Even though clearly a suicide in the family or, you know, of someone very close to you is a cause for grief and, you know, all kinds of problems to arise, but it you somehow switched the focus on that to your yourself and your body dysphoria as the cause of the stress that you were experiencing at that time. Yeah, it was, it's, you know, I've always had, um, I mean, I would say since I was around 13 or so, I've always had what would be categorized as uh, sex dysphoria. So it's, it's not anything new that I've dealt with. I, however, didn't, you know, there was no name for it or anything. I just, I was uncomfortable with my body, you know, (laughs) Um, it wasn't until, you know, trans trans ideology kind of came along and said oh you're uncomfortable with your body because you're in the wrong body and i think that's easier personally i think that was easier for me to face up to and say oh yes i'm really a man trapped in a woman's body than to recognize that i had been abused and harmed throughout my life and that led me to be so uncomfortable with myself so so the dysphoria was always there and i think everything else just drove it drove my depression worse, which just aggravated every mental health issue I had. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, social media also played a role in your decision. I was reading in your uh, article you have on the Fourth Wave Now website. Can you talk about the videos that you were watching at that time? Oh, yeah. I, 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 I chart this up a little. I mean, everybody falls into this, I think, you know, watching YouTube videos of, of your favorite thing or whatever. And uh, I chart this up a little bit to my ADHD, which I haven't been, I wasn't diagnosed with till already two years into transitioning. Um, but I became very obsessed with transition. And then I became very obsessed with watching uh, transition YouTubes, like, you know, females transitioning to men and the, their timelines and the surgeries they'd have and all that kind of stuff. And I mean, I spent a good year probably just 
locked in my bedroom for most of the day, just depressed watching these videos. And I, I really, it was very detrimental to my, my ability to kind of reason and to really get my mental health under control, which was the true culprit of my issues. Mm -hmm. And so you made the decision to transition and you went to a doctor and got a prescription for testosterone. Walk us through it. I, I actually, I wasn't completely sure I still wanted, I was wanting to transition. I wasn't sure. Uh, I, I felt like I was probably trans, but I wasn't sure. I really just was kind of waffling on it. I was really, I didn't want to medically transition. It scared me, but I felt like that was the only option I had to feel better. And so I actually did go see a therapist, even though I didn't have to in my state. I could have just walked into a Planned Parenthood and got testosterone probably the same day. But I did go see a therapist and I was saw her for about three or four months. And when I went to see her, the first thing I said to her in our first visit was, I think I might be trans, but I don't know. I need help f figuring it out. Well, fast forward four months and she pretty much just affirmed, affirmed, affirmed everything, didn't question anything. And really, it kind of, I think, encouraged me down the path of transition as really the only way to deal with my issues. Okay. And so, you know, then, and she, uh, she also wrote me a letter for, to be able to transition, although she didn't need to, it's just kind of one of those things. They still Are you kind still of in touch with this therapist at all? I'm not. No, no, I haven't been in touch since I had my mastectomy. Cause as soon as I scheduled the mastectomy, she was like, okay, you're good to go. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> so do you feel abandoned by this? therapist yeah you know not really I really was in a very I felt like I was in a very positive place and I, I felt like after my second I felt really happy and everything seemed to be looking up so that was fine in hindsight now after detransitioning and looking back I've had to work through some real real hatred towards her because oh. she didn't she didn't help me she she made it worse and she didn't ask any questions she should have she never asked any questions about my yeah me being a lesbian. She didn't ask questions about homo internalized homophobia or homophobia I had experienced or childhood abuse or anything. Nothing of that was ever talked is about. There, is there any legal recourse for this? Did you consider suing her? I did. And I did look into it. It's very, very hard to sue a therapist. It's very hard. And especially it's very hard in California because it is a kind of a one year, like, length of time you can sue a doctor and therapists fall into the same category as a doctor. And it's, it had already been four or five years since I saw her. Yeah. And then on top of that, there is no actual guidelines uh, for helping people or for dealing with people who have uh, dysphoria or who are trans identified. There are no like guidelines or, or well, there's guidelines, but there's no rules. No one's held accountable to follow any guidelines. Mm -hmm. So, there's been there'd be nothing for me to point to as anything she did wrong that would hold up in court. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about nature versus nurture. Obviously, we we all have a bio makeup that is inherent, but then there's also nurture and how you're raised and how you're brought up. What do you think the social factors were for you growing up that led you to go down this path? I would say if I had to point to the number one issue, um, it would be my childhood abuse. I was very physically abused and emotionally abused and to a certain extent sexual sexual abuse. Well, so there was no touching, but it was a sexualized kind of thing, um, you know, exposure to stuff that I shouldn't have been exposed to. And that started at about age four. So I had severe physical abuse from my mother and my stepfather until the age of nine. And then um, my stepfather was out of the picture by then. So most of the very harsh physical abuse stopped. But my mother was still a very narcissistic, abusive, homophobic woman and a very religious as well. Um, so I think that was the main thing that that the abuse caused me to dissociate from my body very young. Because to survive a physical abuse, often we have to. And I think I dissociated very, very young from my body. I never felt connected to my body. And, you know, that's one of those key things you hear so many trans people say and even trans supportive therapists say, oh, you know, you don't feel like you belong to your body. Your body feels wrong. Well, there's many reasons one could feel that way. And I think I felt that way from abuse. Kind of the second part to that is the the homophobia. My, my mother was very homophobic and... Um, 
would point out to me very young people she thought were gay and and warn me that they would try to kidnap me or molest me or <laughs> do all these kinds of things. Um, also, I was quite a tomboy. So from a very young age, I would say seven, my mother would often tell me I needed to stop acting like a boy, act like a girl. I would walk like a boy. I should walk like a girl. So I was very hyper aware and conditioned to kind of be aware of these sex or gender stereotypes and to understand that I wasn't performing them correctly. Right. Let's let's continue talking about homophobia and how transgender ideology has actually a homophobic element to it. How has transgender ideology impacted the the lesbian community? Before you transitioned, talk about what you saw going on and then how your community was impacted while you were transitioning and then how it impacted you and your community after the end. Okay. Well, I, as an older person, so when I transitioned, I, I wasn't too involved in my local gay community much anymore about a person to person level, because, you know, I think that happens to a lot of us <laughs> lesbians. We get married, we settle down and we don't really go out and do much anymore. But when I was, when I was younger, um, early twenties, when I first came out in, in the community, that's when I would say the first, or maybe the second, I don't know, but a big wave of, of identifying as trans came through about 2002. And that was when, you know, it seemed like overnight, all the butch women just started to identify as men. And I, I was very taken back by that. And I think really it just boiled down to stereotypes. It boiled down to them not wanting to be perceived as butch, but wanting to be perceived as men. Because it, it, and, it was and maybe not wanting to be perceived as lesbian, not wanting to be perceived as gay. Is that a part of it, too? I, I think so. The, the big thing. <laughs> yeah, I remember the, the big thing with that is um, calling myself a lesbian now is is I do that on purpose because I was always so scared to say that. And when I first came out, we didn't use lesbian anymore. No, no woman I was ever around, except if they were much older, used the term lesbian. Everybody called themselves gay because lesbian just seemed like icky. I use it now because it's, it's for me, it's more of a political statement, too. And it's it's something that needs to be, I think, brought back. So, yeah, I think there's 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 been I mean, the gay community has has internalized homophobia. Obviously, that's we're not without it. And I think that's why we feel so hard for trans ideology. So you transitioned. You, after four months of testosterone treatments, you had your breasts removed. Mm -hmm. You remained on testosterone for how long after that? About four years. I was on total a uh, total of four years. And what happened to your body during those <laughs> four years? Um, well, I, I like to joke that I never really slept in those four years because testosterone is, uh, it gives you a lot of energy. And it it really it's a mood enhancer, too. It makes you feel better. So if you're a depressed woman and you get on testosterone, you're going to feel better. And that's kind of that's why a lot of like the therapist told me, she told me, well, just try it, because if it's meant to be, if it works for you, you'll know because you'll feel better. Well, that's true, but it's not true for the reason they're saying it's true. It's true because it's a it's a controlled substance that makes you feel better, like any drug will do. Mm hmm. Uh, I started losing my hair pretty quickly. I also gained a lot of body hair really quickly, and that's just kind of the turn of genetics, which was which was pretty good for passing. Once you have a beard, it doesn't matter how small you are or what your voice sounds like. Most people who aren't in the know about transitioning are gonna just assume you're a weird guy hmm. or, or a gay man. I think I got I think I got seen as a gay man more than anything else mm -hmm. because of the way I talked and and mannerisms and stuff like that. I also experienced a lot of uh, uterine and pelvic pain because of the atrophy. And that started about a year in. The doctor told me that was normal. I could just have a hysterectomy. Oh <laughs> but I, I didn't, luckily, did not have a hysterectomy. I'm very thankful for that. I had a severe vaginal atrophy. By the time I stopped testosterone, it was just so painful every single day. Also, I my um, cholesterol had climbed pretty significantly. 
that last blood test I took before stopping testosterone, it was into the, the range of them going to need to prescribe me medication um, to bring it down. Um, my blood glucose was rising, so I was going to have uh, issues with diabetes. And this was in the span of four years. When I started, I was healthy. And I, I've always, I've never been a huge, like, junk food person or anything like that. I walk daily, so I'm not an unhealthy person. And in the span of four years, I went from being fine, healthy, to having, like, all these issues. And I stopped the testosterone, and I had blood tests three months after my last shot, and all those numbers dropped. That, that's that's wonderful news. Is that yeah. a, is that a normal thing to happen when you start detransitioning? Like right away, you notice a physical difference. Oh yeah, I mean like within the first two weeks of of stopping testosterone, like and I tapered off, so it took about two months to be completely done with it. Because mm-hmm. um, if you just stop cold turkey, your body is going to really freak out, and and you're going to have a really tough time. Wow. Um, so it was it's best to taper off slowly. So I tapered off and I was under the care of an endocrinologist. And so once I had that final shot after tapering, within two or three weeks, my vaginal atrophy had almost disappeared. Like I was surprised that my body kind of bounced back as well as it did, especially for my age, you know, being already in my late 30s. <laughs> if you could talk to every woman out there who is identifying as a trans man and has maybe been on testosterone for two years, three years, and they're considering detransitioning, what what would you say to them? I would say that it is probably the most healthy thing you can do, both for your body and, and your, your mental state. Because testosterone and, and living that kind of life, kind of, in my opinion, it's, it felt to me like living a lie every day. And it, not to say it didn't help my, it didn't help me in some ways, but it did harm in other ways. And to me, it was just a wash. So ultimately, the healthiest thing you can do is to leave your body alone. Leave it alone and let it exist as it's meant to exist. The solution to disassociation from the body is reconnection to the body, right? Mm-hmm. How, how have you reconnected to your body through all of this? I have to say that the thing that's really helped me is to understand the reasons why I dissociated, to understand what the dissociation is, and then to get reacquainted and tied in with with my femaleness, with being a woman, with embracing that. And I, I have to say that's where radical feminist ideas and um, support groups and things like that have really helped. If it wasn't for radical feminist ideas for me i don't know if i would have detransitioned quite as well as i did i think i probably would have eventually just from the health issues but i also needed that social awareness i needed that social change that different perspective to be able to embrace myself and i found a lot of healing in the detrans radical feminist community especially right the personal is political and mm-hmm. that brings me to uh, something else I wanted to talk about today, which is the Women's Human Rights Campaign and the work that she, lesbian feminist Sheila Jeffries is doing, uh, along with thousands of women across the world, hopefully hundreds of thousands at some point, to to really get our our leaders, our our politicians and governments to understand that what women need are sex-based rights Mm -hmm. and that sex is not the same as gender identity. Can you talk a little bit about your political activism and how, you know, what your plans for the future and what you want to do now that you're in the radical feminist community? I've definitely refocused myself to be very, very female focused and, and to really, I hope to go back to school and um, get my degree in mental health. I want to be a psychologist and I want to be able to help specifically women. I want the focus to be there because I think even psychology has a long history and still does, just does not do well with addressing women's issues because they are unique. Um, I've also been active in doing some writing. Um, I am currently working on a website for detransitioners with some other 
detransitioned women and feminists. Um, it should be launched in a couple weeks. That's that's pretty much what I've been doing. And, you know, I'm mostly a stay at home mom. So that's work right there. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Unpaid work. <laughs> All right. So can you talk to us about the time you worked in mental health at a hospital with teenage girls and what that experience was like for sure. you? Sure. So um, out of college, I got a job. Uh, this was 2000. It's about July of 2018. I got a job at a youth facility, mental hospital, a locked facility, and served ages 12 to 17. Um, it was mixed sex, so there was both boys and girls. But and I was still identifying as I was still living as a trans man. So I mean, I looked. I guess everybody was assuming I was a guy. Can't read minds, but <laughs> I was living as such. It's something that struck me uh, when I started working there is how many of these girls came in identifying as trans. Now, I, I'm older and I came, I kind of came from the older trans idea that um, to be trans is very rare and it's, you know, a medical condition and you transition to alleviate it and blah, blah, blah. And that's what I thought about myself. But when I started seeing so many of these young girls come in claiming to be really trans men or non-binary or whatever they were identifying as, I was like, what, what is going on here? This is, this is just... This, is, this just shouldn't be. This shouldn't be this many. And the other thing that struck me is so many young tomboyish or butch girls. I, I'd look at them and, and, you know, the first thing that would pop in my head is, oh, look at the little lesbian. Like, she's going to grow up. She's going to be a little lesbian, a little butch girl. That's cute. But they weren't. They were identifying as men. They were identifying as trans men. And I felt like there was this there was this shame in me and there was this this sadness in me. And I wanted to reach out to this one girl in particular I wanted to reach out to her and tell her, it's okay that you're a lesbian. It's okay that you're butch. You can grow up and you can have a good life. And then I thought, I can't tell her that, though, because I'm sitting here with a beard with my boobs cut off because I couldn't do it. And that just, that sunk me. I, that really drove something home to me that my motivation for transitioning probably had a lot to do with my internalized homophobia. Yeah, and what an intense realization, which brings me to the next thing I wanted to talk to you about is the conflict sometimes between radical feminists who have not transitioned and radical feminists or women who have transitioned. The subject matter of what we're, what we're dealing with here is so hard. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine, I mean, you're unique in being able to speak so freely and openly, and I'm so grateful, but, and so are all of our listeners. We want, I, I can speak for myself only, but I know that also the WLRN collective is extremely grateful to have you on our program because this stuff is really hard to talk about. Yeah, it is. It definitely is. And, and, it's, so, and it's so personal. Yeah. Right. It's so personal. So can you can you just tell us a little bit about your experiences with radical feminism and radical feminists and detransitioning and the detransitioning community and some of the conflict that you've seen there? So some of the major conflict I've seen is that often what happens is radical feminists group, whatever the group may be, is, you know, can be very supportive and really reach out and, and take in detransitioned women. And, and that can be very healing and that can be very good. However, what I have seen sometimes and what I have heard other detransitioners who are a bit older than me talk about is sometimes we can be used as tokens to get across a political message. And um, sometimes there is a loss of sight that we are women who hurt and have been very hurt by patriarchy and have hurt ourselves because of patriarchy. And especially if you're newly detransitioned, it's a very vulnerable and like sensitive time and you can't really be thrust into the spotlight. You can't really be put into a political realm. Even if you say you want to, I think we got to be aware that, you know, most of these women are looking for some way to like make a difference and get back and get out some of that, that anger and sadness. But at the same time, like healing has to come first. And I think sometimes that that is kind of a conflict there. And also another thing I, I've seen is that for women who have never experienced that kind of hatred of your, your female body, of your female self, 
it's really hard for them, I think, to wrap their head around why you would do, why you would transition. And I think that's kind of a key to understanding our motivation. Because most of us, the vast majority of us didn't transition because we wanted to have a better life or we thought we could get male privilege or something like that. We transitioned because we hated ourselves and we wanted to destroy ourselves, uh, destroy the femaleness in some way. And I, I, I just wish there was kind of an understanding and compassion there for that aspect of it, that we're, we've been very hurt by, by our society, by patriarchy. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing with me today and all of our listeners. It's, it's really been awesome to talk to you, Carol. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's been, it's been, it's been great to do this interview. So speak out, speak over, speak under, speak through the noise. Speak loud so I can hear you. I want to know you. I want to hear your real voice. You are listening to WLRN. on women's sex-based rights presented by the newly formed Women's Human Rights Campaign is the first time, to my knowledge, that women have drafted a comprehensive political statement of this kind. Since French feminist Olympe de Gouges wrote the Declaration of the Rights of Women in 1791, women in the 21st century have uniquely modern problems in addition to the ancient ones we've never resolved, and we were long overdue for a unifying political statement on our sex-based rights that speak to our current reality. The WHRC Declaration's first article establishes that women's rights are based upon our biological sex, and it makes sense the writers would start here given the current political climate in many developed countries. Without acknowledgement of the female sexed body and its value, vulnerability, and meaning to males, any other right women might claim for themselves becomes inapplicable and indefensible when attacked. The only thing all female human beings have in common, regardless of their race, sexuality, class, physical and mental health, age, religion, etc., is biology. And it is because of our biology, our sex, our reproductive capacity, our lesser physical strength compared to males, that we have, as a sex, been oppressed in the same way as all over the world for thousands of years. Denying biological sex as the exclusive definition of femaleness, of womanhood and girlhood, leads to the erasure of specifically misogynistic oppression of the female body, and prevents us from explaining why we as individuals are raped, killed, stalked, forcibly impregnated, denied abortions, etc. by the male sex. Men understand this, which is why they now so aggressively try to replace biological sex with gender identity in their definition of woman, girl, and female. They purposely seek to obscure what should be blatant fact to any sane person, that women are uniquely sexed and differently sexed than men, in order to sabotage women's pursuit of human rights and access to single-sex spaces and services. The Declaration of Women's Sex-Based Rights covers all the bases in Articles 2 through 9, asserting that motherhood is an exclusively female experience, and that women should have the right to control their reproductive systems, to freely express their opinions, to peacefully assemble, to participate in politics with equal opportunity to men, and to be free of male violence and appropriately supported after experiencing it. These are the most basic human rights that most, if not all, self-proclaimed democracies in the world claim to grant their citizens. Yet in 2020, women still feel the need to claim these rights as their own and to fight for their daily, real-world recognition in male society. While the gender identity issue is a clear thread throughout the Declaration, it isn't the only reason why the female sex still struggles to comfortably and unconditionally enjoy the rights listed. Even if gender identity was a non-issue in the world, this declaration would be just as necessary, 
and could read exactly the same, because ultimately, women and girls are denied the rights claimed in this document because they are female. Gender identity is only the latest weapon men use to oppress women or else defend their pre-existing methods of oppression. It appears the women who wrote the declaration understand this perfectly. As of this recording, over 11,000 people have signed the Declaration of Women's Sex-Based Rights, representing 118 countries and 233 organizations. These numbers should encourage you. They demonstrate a significant amount of support around the world for the most essential women's rights. The number of signatories and their home nations also show us that women everywhere can agree on our basic rights despite our many differences with each other. Such unity is always the beginning of effective political action and its resultant change. Strength in numbers, as the idiom goes. The greater number of women who unite with each other behind a feminist platform, the more power we have collectively to triumph over male oppression and resistance to our progress. The mere act of drafting a Declaration of Rights is a bold and assertive move on women's part. We are no longer passively accepting our oppression. We are sending men a clear message. Women are human beings, and we will not tolerate being treated as anything else. That concludes WLRN's special edition podcast on the Women's Human Rights Campaign. Thanks so much to Vajra Ma and Carol for speaking with us on this topic. I know firsthand the misogynistic backlash women experience in the face of trans and men's rights activism. It is not, and never has been, an easy road. And as always, our strength is in our solidarity. That includes you too, dear listener. Thank you for being here today. This is Thistle Pedersen, over and out. And this is Sekhmet Shiawal. If you haven't already done so, log on to womensdeclaration.com and add your name to the Women's Declaration on Sex-Based Rights. Thanks for listening to today's special edition podcast. Women's Liberation Radio News is grassroots, volunteer-driven, radical feminist radio. Head over to wlrnmedia.wordpress.com to sign up for our newsletter, listen to podcasts and extended interviews, and check out our blog posts. Until next time, stay strong in the struggle. WLRN Media is produced with tender loving care for women worldwide. Prioritize your sisters in a world that prioritizes men. Thanks for staying tuned to Feminist Community Radio. We love to hear from our listeners, so please comment, like, and share this production widely. Until next time, this is WLRN sound engineer Jenna DeCuardo hoping you're staying safe and healthy. for the patriarchal kiss how will we find what needs to be shown and then after that where is home tell me where is my home cause gender hurts